All right, thank you, Rex. And we are excited and glad to have you guys here, as Matt said, for our first retreat. And you know at the first retreat, we're not going to send you home without a gift. I've always wanted to do this. Can you guys reach under your chairs right now? I put a gift under your seat this time. This is not a joke. Check it out. It is a lantern, baby. You got your own CBC Tustin lantern. Yeah, it's got batteries in it already. You don't have to buy them. Be very careful. It's, it's super bright. It's about as bright as an infinity stone, okay? When you put that thing up there, I'm pretty sure that's what the Avengers used to capture that. But if you get lost on the retreat, all you got to do is pull the light out like this and start singing this little light of mine and somebody will come find you. No, this is hopefully a little tool you can stick in your garage. You can take it with you when you go camping. I won't be doing that, um, but you could choose to do that <coughs> if you would like to. Um, but that's a gift from us to you. Yeah, hey, you know we love you guys. <coughs> now, uh, it's, it's encouraging to see a room full of men, and what I don't want to do is have this be something that is just an experience. What we want to do is do something here that creates momentum and that creates real change, and maybe we shouldn't put those together right now, guys. Maybe that would be the right thing to do. See, I thought I was dealing with a room full of mature men who could put that back under their seat afterwards. But I realize I'm talking to the edge camp who has to reach under their seats and play with the gift immediately. What we want to do before we play with the awesome gifts that we've been given is dive into the Word of God. And we want to make sure that we, we make this not just an experience. Because that's the temptation when you go on retreats before. Raise your hand if you've been on a men's retreat. Been to a men's retreat before. You can go. You can have a great time. You can get no sleep because the guy in your room snores. You can get all the you know, s'mores you want and all that stuff. You walk away with a couple great stories. But if you don't really change, then, then what was the point? So that's what we want to make sure does not happen here. And if we go to the Word of God and we apply ourselves to the Word of God, I think something great and profound can happen here. Because anytime you open the scriptures, what we're dealing with is the the living, breathing word of God. And when we go to that for change, then we really have something amazing happen. You guys know the name uh, Ernest Shackleton? Anybody know that name, Ernest Shackleton? Yeah, he was an explorer. Uh, And I think it was around the beginning of the 1900s, he put an ad in the London Times that said this, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. That's what he put in the London Times in 1914. You would think with an ad like that today, nobody would respond. But the interesting thing is hundreds of men responded to that. Because I think there is innate in man a desire to pursue something ambitious. And it's good to desire those challenges. And I think when challenges are set before somebody and they're set before a man rightly and correctly, they can be that spurring on to do something great. In essence, that's what we're doing this weekend as we step away. We're asking you guys to take a look at the scriptures and take a look at what the scriptures say it is to be a man, to be a leader, to be self-controlled, and go do something great for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ because of that. But one of the reasons why I think this worked with those guys is because Shackleton wasn't trying to cover it up. He wasn't trying to say, this is, oh, this is going to be a cakewalk, guys. You're going to get your name in the record books. It's going to be easy. He was very clear up front that this is going to be arduous. This is going to be difficult. But if you do it right, and if you survive, what did he say? Honor and recognition. Now, what they were aiming for is simple fame, fame that comes from man. What we're aiming for is glory that goes to God and then commendation that comes from God When he says, well done, good and faithful servant, nothing should be more encouraging and exciting to us than that. So what we want to talk about is the call to leadership, right? And the call to leadership under this with self-control. So don't hear me tonight as if we're going to lay out a pattern for how you lead. That's another talk for another time, probably a good conference for us to have in another time. Like, this is how you lead. This is what you're going to do. But this is how self-control will apply to leadership because leadership is so powerful. It impacts people. So it can be used for great good or it can be used for great destruction. That's why you must have self-control with your leadership because if not, something very bad is going to happen to the people that God has entrusted you. 
And if you're here today, you probably have some area of exercise of leadership in your life. It is either a, you're a family man, you've got a wife and kids, you're a ministry lead, you've got an area of leadership at work, you, you have some sort of, of leadership. Maybe you own a home and you have an, an area that you, you oversee there. There's some area of leadership that you exercise in your life. And what you want to do is make sure you're ambitious to develop that for the honor and glory of God and not your own. So that's why we need to make sure that self-control is applied to your leadership. Now, why do we need to talk about self-control? Because I think there are two dangers, okay? I'd like you to write these two dangers down. We're not into the points yet. I just want you to write these two dangers down because I believe just in my dealings in men's ministry back at the old church, I was the men's pastor down there, counseling today, fighting temptation in my own life. Here are the two broad common ways that if you lack self-control and leadership, it's going to be abused or it's going to be abandoned, okay? First is escapism, okay? If you don't have self-control... You will retreat to escapism, and you will not be a leader. Self-control is going to help you, and we'll talk about why and how in a moment. But this has been a common temptation, I think, ever since you know, the greatest generation passed, for people who live in an environment like we are blessed to live in the United States, who have so much comfort and ease around them. This is one that's driven by comfort and ease, and maybe a little bit of people-pleasing, where I don't want to ruffle any feathers, I don't want to rock the boat, so I'm just going to kind of retreat and escape over here. Because you need to fundamentally understand when you're given a role of leadership, there is responsibility placed on you. And when you begin to understand that, you feel the weightiness of the call of leadership. And if you escape, that would be like being a coward. That'd be like retreating, and you can't do that. There's responsibility put upon you in that sense. You guys know D-Day, we celebrated the 75th anniversary two days ago, a day ago? Yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, 75 years, right? You know, Eisenhower was one of the ones who helped plan that. I was reading uh, something very interesting about it. Listen to how he viewed his leadership and how he accepted the responsibility. He didn't run from the fight, but he accepted the responsibility. So listen to how Eisenhower viewed this. So as he walked into it, he was confident of his, uh, his team's success. He said this, this operation is planned as victory. He was going in confident, and that's the way it's going to be. We're down there, and we're going to go throw everything we have into it. But do you know that he also wrote a letter that said, I accept complete fault for this failure. He wrote it out in shorthand and put it in his drawer in case they didn't accomplish what he as the leader planned out. And as I read that, I thought, yeah, yeah. That's what you're stepping into with leadership. I know why people retreat from it and they escape from it because responsibility is there. And if you fail, it's on you. Eisenhower understood that and he accepted that and he took the challenge and he stood up to fight against the Nazis who are going to come against us. That's what you have to be willing to do. You cannot uh, go towards ease. You can't drift towards weakness. You have to say, no, this is a, a mantle given to me. I must take it up in that sense. If you want a, an unfortunate biblical example of this, just write down Genesis 3. Genesis 3, 1 to 7. We don't have time to turn there, but I will, I will just, I'll quote it for you because it's so ominous. That's where, if you know your Bible, uh, Eve eats the fruit after the temptation. And you know what the phrase is? She turns to her husband who was with her and gives him the fruit and he eats. That's him escaping he was handed the mantle of leadership. He was designed to protect his wife. He was designed to uphold God's word and his command. And he sat by passively and did nothing. That's why Romans chapter 5, when you read who plunged mankind into sin, it's not Eve that's mentioned. It's Adam, because ultimately the leader is held responsible for not stepping up and doing what he should be doing. So I'm assuming that in here, if you have a temptation Maybe it's towards escaping, and you're not going to grab this mantle. I don't want you to do that. But the opposite of that is swinging to the other side, empire building. Okay? That's the second one, empire building. And this is where you get to a point where, uh, you know, aggressive becomes aggression. You get the difference between those two things? I want to be aggressive as I pursue the glory of God, but I don't want to have aggression be what's guiding me. 
I don't want to get to the point where I'm promoting myself and building things for myself and doing things for myself and using people rather than developing people because I'm trying to build an empire for my namesake. So you see how that's the opposite of escapism. This one is, I don't want the leadership at all. This one is, I want it so much that I'm going to build it up and I'm going to promote myself to do that. You want the scriptural example of that? Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4. You read that chapter? What does he do when he walks out in the patio? He goes, is this not Babylon, the great city which I have built? You know what happens to him right after that? He turns into a cow and God strikes him down and humbles him until he acknowledges that, wow, I'm only able to do this because the God who runs all things gives me that. So we have one of those two things, and I don't want that to be either one of you. That's why I think we need to get to the point where we exercise self-control in leadership to use the ambition and the drive and the desire that God gives us to be honed for him and not to ourselves. That's what I want to aim at tonight. So to do that, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 31, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. First Corinthians 10, 31. Now, if you remember when we started this whole thing about running the race, we were in chapter nine and Paul was saying as an athlete does these arduous, strenuous training things. That's what we need to be doing to pursue the glory of God. Chapters 8 through 10 really are a great exercise in leadership. If you ever just want to be like, okay, what does it look like to be a great leader? Just read 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, and you see that Paul gives up everything in service to the glory of God and the good of other people. And when you begin to fund, fundamentally understand that, that's going to make you an effective leader. So look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31. We're going to go all the way to chapter 11, verse 1, as I read. It says this, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. When you take the, the power that's in that paragraph right there, that is the self-control that you need to make sure that you are not going to go to either extreme of the leadership approaches that are going to cause harm and damage, either by not protecting people or by crushing them because you want to build your name, but it's going to hone you right. And it fundamentally gets down then to a gospel issue at this point in time. Because when we come to understand that we've been saved by grace through faith, there's no room for pride, is there? Why do you think Jesus, as he's on the road with the disciples, remember this, we just went through 8 through 10, do you think it's a struggle for people in Christian leadership, in Christian circles, to struggle with empire building? Isn't that what the disciples were doing in 8 through 10? As they're walking to the cross, they're talking about what? Which one of us is the greatest? Where are we going to sit in the kingdom? And that's their temptation with Jesus. And what does he say over and over again? No, I'm here to give my life as a ransom for many, and I'm here to do this so that you might follow in my example. See, when it comes down to it, when we realize what Christ has given to us, and we realize what he sacrificed for us, the call then to be ambitious for his honor and glory makes the most sense. So this comes down to a fundamental gospel issue. Have you responded to that? If you're here and you haven't responded to the gospel call, nothing I'm going to say should make sense to you because I'm going to call you to radical sacrifice. I'm going to call you to boasting up the name of God, not yours. And I'm going to tell you to do these things. But if you haven't had that concept of Jesus Christ saving you, it's not going to make any difference to you. But if you've repented of your sins, then you realize fundamentally, oh, this is the response that I give to the God who saved me by grace through faith. Paul knew that. Paul realized, okay, what God has done for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, no one can boast because Christ has saved me. Now he's saying this, whatever I do, I do it all to the honor and glory of God. So let's give a Christian definition of what I think uh, Christ-like leadership is. I think I got it up here. You can write this down in your, uh, or do we call them journals? Is that manly enough? Weekend retreat notes. You can write it down in there. I think we got it up there. Yeah, if you can see that, I'll read it for you. Christ-like leadership or godly leadership is this. It is delegated authority that is responsible for influencing others to achieve their purpose of glorifying God. So godly leadership or Christ-like leadership is the delegated authority that is responsible for influencing others to achieve their purpose of glorifying God. 
Everything that God does, he does for his glory. He does for his namesake. I've been working through Psalm 106. See, that's why I love every day in the word. You just, you go through, you're forced to go through every chapter in the Bible. And sometimes, you know, chapters that you're not familiar with, you go through it. We just went through Psalm 106 a couple weeks ago. I was just hit between the eyes between that. And recently in there, he has a section. Remember that he saved them for his name's sake. So God acted in the Old Testament when he saved his people for his name's sake, to represent his glory. And so that's why God does everything. God is the God who deserves worship. He's the God who deserves the glory. And that's why Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever I do, whether I eat or drink, I'm gonna do it all to the glory of God, whatever I do. Now, I don't think we need to think whatever I eat or drink as like specific meal times, although that does apply to it because it's whatever we do. But as you read the chapter of 1 Corinthians 10, it's this, it's like, where should I be spending my time in fellowship and meals? There's, you know, should I go to the idol temples and do that over there? So it's not just specifically like, you know, should I be on a paleo diet or should I be on this type of diet? But it's like, what does my presence here represent? And what would this do to the name of God if I were here in that sense? And what does my fellowship with these things mean for the worship of Jesus Christ? So everything that we do is brought into that. But if you're, if you're a leader, your job is now to make sure that you're influencing the people under you to achieve their purpose of glorifying God. Do you see how that stops you from empire building? You can't build your namesake if you're trying to live for the sake of God. That makes it incredibly clear. See, Paul never wanted to make other Pauls. What did he say? If you imitate me, you do it because I'm following Christ. And that's all we're ever trying to do. It's delegated authority, so we don't think that it it starts with us. It's been given to us by God, a gracious deposit, And it's now pushing other people and helping them, enhancing them, developing them so that they might glorify God. That's what we mean when we talk about Christian leadership. Now, can we just pause here for a moment? Because it sounds kind of weird that Paul's saying this. Did you catch the phrase? Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. Now, that sounds almost like the escapism of like, oh, I'm going to lean over here to people-pleasing, and I'm never going to ruffle feathers, and I'm just going to, I'm going to passively go by so that everybody, you know, I won't push my wife to do these certain things, and I won't challenge people in my small group to do this, and I, I'm not going to do that because I'm going I'm I'm to please everybody in that sense. But that's clearly not what Paul's saying here, and Paul's not into that type of people-pleasing. Remember Galatians 1? If, I, if I'm a servant of man, if I please man, I can't be a servant of God. So clearly he's serving God here. So what does he mean? What he means here is I'm trying to make sure that Jews and Greeks, whatever it is, I'm, gonna, I'm going to enhance myself. I'm going to maneuver myself in such a way that I make an impact in their life. That's what I think he means by pleasing. I don't think he's trying to say, I'm trying to people please here. I'm trying to make sure that I'm going to get maximum impact in their life. And you see that Paul did that all throughout the book of Acts. That's how he would do it. He would tell you know, one of his people, you shouldn't get circumcised. He'd tell another person, you should get circumcised so you can have more of an impact there. You just got to think, how is my ministry now going to impact people? So it's not people pleasing, but he's trying to have the biggest impact with the, with the position that he has. So this is a, a very important um, topic for us to think about <clears throat> as we move forward. Now, as you have this, okay, you have this goal and drive and desire What is going to help you fight against it? Can you look up earlier in the chapter to verse six? You got to fight these passions that are inside of you. There are these passions that are that are going to cause you to either try to empire build, or they're going to try to you're going to try to escape. And we want to fight that. How do we do that? Look at First Corinthians ten, verses six through thirteen. Says this. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will never allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with that temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So as I'm hoping you read 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 11, 1, and you start to feel this passion and ambition that it is honed right where it needs to be in this Christ-like leadership. But if you feel yourself either going to one way or going to the other, you should start to look at verses 6 through 13 and start to say, I need to start fighting these specifically and learning from the examples and failures of others. Can we be real and honest here at Men's Retreats? I think it's good. I think it's good to be honest anytime you preach. That's always a good thing to just communicate honestly. But real and honest in that sense. If you look at this, it says, now these things took place as examples for us. So Paul looks back at the Old Testament and he looks at the bad example of the Israelites who did not follow God and he says, you shouldn't do that. You guys before us today just have example after example in the news, in sports of fallen leaders who fall under these categories. And I need you to look at those and realize he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. I can't, I can't tell you the amount of disappointment and dishonor it brings to Jesus Christ at the number of mega pastors who have fallen into sexual immorality. But that's a leader who's gone into an empire building who thinks he deserves, deserves something and is above everybody. As I see that happen, I want to have in my mind a mental graveyard of those fallen leaders who went the wrong way. And I want to look at that and say, If I don't fight this, what's to say that wouldn't be me? If I see somebody escape and run when they should stay and stand, and I watch the devastation of somebody doing that to a family, crushing them, killing them, I want to look at that and go, what's going on there? Why did that guy divorce that person? Why did that guy leave that responsibility? Why did all that damage happen? And I want to look at those and I want to say, those are real things that could happen to me. And if I don't have this ambition honing me to live for the glory of God and promote the glory of God, I'm tempted to go one of those either, one of those ways. So now I want to take you guys to an Old Testament example of what I think 1 Corinthians 10.31 is, and we're going to run it through the four G's to show how you're going to fight that. So let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. Remember, we were in Nehemiah about a year ago. And as I was studying 1 Corinthians 10.31, I said, This is a picture of what Nehemiah has done. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. We want to make sure that we fully live these things out. For the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, Nehemiah chapter 1. Now remember, Nehemiah is a man who has a leadership position that's high up in the kingly uh, Medo-Persian type environment. So he's high up over there. So he already has a leadership position. But he has a burning passion for the name of God, if you remember that. The walls in Jerusalem are down, the temple's down. Everybody needs to go back and build up that place. So Nehemiah has this passion. Listen to what happens when he hears the gates are down and the name of God is being reviled. Nehemiah 1.4. It says this, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the Lord God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I pray before you night and day for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. We have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house, we've sinned. We've acted corruptly against you. We have not kept your commandments, the statutes and rules that you've commanded. Remember your word, O Lord, that you commanded your servants, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return and keep my commandments and do them, though you are outcasts from the uttermost parts of heaven, there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant who delights to fear your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah has a deep passion 
for the honor and glory of God. He knows his rightful place and position. He has been delegated a responsibility. God, I am your servant. You have redeemed me. Now use me for your name's sake and give me success because I want to do so for your honor and glory. So Nehemiah has the right goal. Remember, that's our first G, right? So first G. So if you want to write it down this way, be clear in your praise, I think is the first one, right? Yeah, be clear in your praise. If you want to maintain this self-control, you got to be clear and explicit in your praise. You can't be vague about it. And sometimes you can get into religious speak, spiritual talk, even mystical talk at times. You know, you, you mean maybe you work with somebody and you're talking about it like, oh yeah, I got the, you know, the big guy upstairs helping me. You know, things like that that are just like vague spiritual things that somebody might attach with maybe a God that if you talk to him in that sense. But that's not what the person who's concerned with the name and reputation of God, no, they're very clear where that needs to go. Nehemiah, although he's in a kingdom, is very clear on who the king of the universe is. And he's going to go to him and he's going to make sure that his heart is aligned with him and asking that his name and his reputation is what is upheld. And that's what Nehemiah cares for. You have to be willing to do that. You have to be very clear on where the praise is going. Isn't that matching what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Doesn't matter what it is. It has to be glorifying God's name. It has to be giving him honor in that sense. We have to be very clear on how to do that. Two just quick ways that I think you do that. Your prayer and your planning, okay? Your prayer and your planning. Obviously, we see Nehemiah here, and I think you can associate like how prayer would associate with making uh, praise very explicit. Um, you, could, you, you ascribe it to God. You give thanks to his name and all those different things. But when you plan too, and you, you know when we studied Nehemiah, he was, he was big into planning. He had his plans laid out. When you lay those plans out, here's, uh, I think it's Proverbs 16. He said, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So as you're committing your work to the Lord and you're laying out your plans, you're asking God to be the one who guides you through this, to give you wisdom, to make all of this happen because you realize you can't do it in and of yourself. And as you have God involved in the planning and in the prayers, and you don't separate the two, then I think that that's a good way that he's going to get explicit glory. Because if I, if I plan without praying, that seems like arrogance, right? If I'm just going to if I'm just going to plan, that's what James 4, remember that? Come now you who say today or tomorrow, oh, I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to spend a year there, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make this much money. That's a pretty decent plan for a business person. But they're arrogant. They didn't even consider the will of God. What does James say? You should say, if tomorrow I'm going to live, and then I'm going to do this if God grants me the next day. That's the humility to say that God, my prayer to you is recognizing you're in control of all things. And this plan is humbly submitted to you because I want it to be according to your will, not mine. So when you have those two things, I think it makes uh, praise very, very explicit. But what else does Nehemiah do very well? Go down to chapter two. So now he gets into the presence of the king. He gets into the presence of the king and the king looks at him and he's like, ah, oh, you look kind of sick, buddy. Is everything okay? Has an opportunity to lay out the plan before the king. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4 says this. The king said to me, what are you requesting? Watch this phrase. So I prayed to the God of heaven. So not only does he take that deep time to in develop that passion in his own secret closet of prayer, but even as he's right before, he's about to enact the plan that he's got. He prays one more time. You know what I think that stresses is dependence. And that's the grace we've been talking about. So we have the goal clear, the glory of God. Now the grace that we need to depend on so number two on your outline, you can write it down this way. Be consistent in your dependence. Guys, this shows up in your spiritual disciplines, in all of them. When you are consistent in your dependence, that's going to keep you in your self-controlled environment. It's going to help you produce the fruit of the Spirit, which has self-control in it. But it's also going to keep you under the, the, the guise of, wow, I'm not, I'm not special in and of myself. I need the grace of God in that sense. So those are things like Bible reading and prayer. But can I talk to you about one that maybe you don't consider? Maybe not anybody considers. So you got, uh, when we say means of grace or, or ways you serve in church to, to be strengthened by God's grace, you got Bible reading, prayer, you got service at church for the different gifts that God has given you. But I think a spiritual discipline that's often overlooked and misunderstood is fasting. When was the last time you heard anybody talk 
about fasting. Now see, fasting can be taken in a very ascetic way and used as a manipulation tool to God. And if that's your mindset of fasting, that's not what we're promoting here. Colossians 2 will tell you that if you perform that severe bodily discipline and it's not attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's nothing. You're not doing anything in that sense. But you notice how many times in the Bible Jesus talks good about fasting. Even in the book of Acts, they, they fasted before they, they did those things. Here's one of the reasons why it helps when you're a leader. Because when you fast, according to the way that the Bible would say it, you fast giving up something that is needed, okay? Like you're saying no to a meal in order to devote yourself to something for a specific service. Now, I can't think of anything that would help train you to be more Christ-like than that. Think about the logic of what Christ did. In Philippians 2, he humbles himself, giving up what is rightfully his to come down and serve. When you are fasting, what you should be doing is this. You say no to a meal that you have every right to have. Right? The Bible doesn't command you to fast. So you have every right to have that meal. But you are willingly giving that up to maybe spend some time praying for somebody who's going through a deep struggle. Wow, now I am really doing something that Christ is doing. I'm saying no to something that's good to try to benefit somebody else in that sense. And what it also teaches you is this. After you skip two meals, see how strong you feel. You're a really dependent creature. And because we're just, we have food, like you open the fridge. You can go to McDonald's, get six Big Macs if you want. And you can eat them all, right? It's at the tip of your fingers. You have no idea what it means to be dependent. You start saying no to food, now you do. When you do that, and again, you don't do it in the sense of I'm going to manipulate you, God. If I fast this long, you owe me this. Or if I'm going to do this, it's going to eradicate every sin. That's not what you do it for. But if you do it for the purpose of maybe serving someone else to pray for them or really honing your own desires to say, God, more than I want this meal, I want you to be in my life. And at that meal time, you spend time reading scriptures and praying. That's going to be a great thing that I think would help you to be consistent in your dependence. If you took time and just, what if you took a day and you really fasted and said, God, let the men of this church fight pornography. God, let the men of this church read their Bibles, and apply it. God, please do that. Can you think of a more worthwhile day? Guys, I think that would do great things if we were to take those moments and be dependent upon God in that sense. Nehemiah here is a man who does that. In fact, let's go to another example of that. Go to chapter five. So this is a way that he sacrifices and will lead us into the next one. Chapter five, verse 13. Nehemiah 5.13, or 14. So Nehemiah, he's given this position of leadership. Watch this. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed governor in the land of Judah, from the 23rd year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, uh, to the 20th year to the 32nd, uh, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took the rations uh, from them daily, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over them. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work of the wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered for the work. Moreover, there were at my men 150 tables, Jews, officials, besides those who came from other nations. Now what was prepared for was at my expense. For each day there was one ox, six choice sheep, birds, every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand The food allowed the governor because the service was too heavy on the people. Remember for my good, O God, all that I have done for this people. You see, now the leadership comes in and he's sacrificing things for himself so that it's not too much of a burden for the people that he's leading in order to make sure that they're able to do what God is calling them to do. When you live in that type of environment, you're honing your ambitions to say, I have the right to do these things. I could take this tax, I could charge the people, but I don't want to do it because I fear God and I see the burden too heavy on the people. That's what the call to leadership is. It demands that type of sacrifice. You see, anytime you talk about sacrifice, it's always easy to go pull sports examples, right? You just pull sports examples. So I thought, you know what? I just, I wail on the Lakers too much. Why don't I go find a good example of a Laker doing something good and bring it as an example 
to the people so they can have a good example of a Laker sacrificing something. So I go on the website and I go www.lakers.com, nothing. www.lakers.com, nothing. www.lakers.com, nothing. And then I realize, oh yeah, the Lakers can't string three W's together so they don't even have a website. (laughs) So I couldn't even find a Lakers example there. So I had to go back to the Warriors. I tried, but I have to go back to the Warriors. Which might go bad for me because they were losing as I walked in here, so I don't know how they're, they're playing tonight. But I do know this. Draymond Green, if you know the name, two months ago was 25 pounds overweight. Like he was just playing bad basketball, and the owner came in and said, dude, if we're going to have a shot at winning the title, you've got to drop some weight. So he said, yeah, you know what? You're exactly right. So in an interview, he said this. It took a lot of mental focus, more so than anything, Green said, about his diet. I just had to have the willpower. Giving up the things that I knew would not be conducive to me reaching the weight that I knew I needed to be at in order to play at the level I have been playing at. So in the article, he details it. I love chips, can't have chips. I love candy, can't have candy. I love soda, can't have soda. I love alcohol, can't have alcohol. He was going through all the things that did not make it conducive to the goal that he ultimately set. So there had to be the sacrifice there. Now listen to it. I think that that helped in that area, but it spread to other areas of my life. And then he ended the the interview by saying this, if you want to do great things, you have to sacrifice something. So it will always be that way. There will always be a sacrifice that is required of you. When we look at the sacrifice of Christ, we realize, well, that purchased our salvation, So now we are freed up to sacrifice in that sense for the people that we're leading, but we want to do so in an environment that's going to be for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ and not ourselves. So here's the cool thing, and it's the third point that we want to write down. We want to do that in a group of men who want to do that same thing. So we've gone from goal to grace to group now. Number three, be careful in choosing your company. Be careful in choosing your company. Paul knew that. He wanted to be around guys that sacrificed. In fact, so much so, didn't he and, uh, was, it, was it Barnabas? They were fighting over John Mark. It was either uh, Barnabas or uh, Silas, one of the two. But they were fighting. They were like, should we bring John Mark or not? No, that guy, he didn't help us last time. I'm not taking him with me. Because he knew you have to have the right people around you. Because the people who are around you are going to be those people who influence you. So what did Nehemiah have? Neither I nor my brothers, we didn't take this. Even his servants got on board with that. Can you flip over to chapter 7? He's talking about his brothers. What was the character of his brothers? Chapter 7, verse 2. Watch this. I gave my brother Hananiah, the governor of the castle, uh, charge over Jerusalem. Watch this. Why? For he was far more faithful and God-fearing than many. That's the type of people Nehemiah surrounded himself with. God-fearing men more than many. In fact, in that chapter, he's going to go on to list almost thousands of people that are in the census. And more so than any of them was his brother faithful and God-fearing in that sense. You will be inspired and encouraged and shown examples and challenged to do sacrificial things when you surround yourself with sacrificial people. That's what your small groups should be in that sense. That's what your community of friends should be. should be those type of people that are doing that because they'll help you know, hey, is this, is this sacrifice for God's glory or yours? You know, what, what's the namesake? Where's it going to? You have those types of accountabilities. I was, I was just so blessed. Uh, Pastor Lucas from uh, AV, I was having a phone call with him about something that I was dealing with um, and I was trying to get his advice from it. And he came back at a challenge to me that I didn't even see, like I didn't even contemplate it. But as I walked away from that conversation, I was like, wow, I'm so thankful that I trust that guy enough to say those types of things to me so that I never get into an environment where I I sin. I don't want to do that. We were talking about the burden of pastoral ministry, and Galatians says, you bear other people's burdens, but you have to watch when you do that that you never fall into temptation yourself. I was like, wow, what a great reminder that guy gave me, that if I'm going to bear burdens for people and I'm going to sacrifice, i got to make sure that I don't fall into any sort of temptation. Those are the type of people you want to surround yourself with. You want to know if you're going to be a good sacrificial leader? Just take a look at the people you spend the most time with. And if you're not spending time with people who are willing to do that, chances are it's not going to rub off on you. Let's be a group of men who do that, who encourage one another, who make it possible. I'm only up here and able to do this because a lot of you do that for me. 
Really, that's the reason Jesse and I can do this, why we can get up and preach. Because a lot of you guys take the sacrificial mindset that I'm going to serve. But the more that we do that, and the more that that spreads, the better it is going to be for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. So be careful with who you surround yourself with. You want to make sure you're doing it for the honor and glory of God. Finally, what is it? Uh, Grit. So number four, be courageous against opposition. Be courageous against opposition. That's in Nehemiah 4. We won't take time to read the whole story. It'd be a good one for you to go back. You could listen to the whole sermon series again if you want to. We keep all of them on the website. You can listen to it. Uh, chapter 4, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, they're coming and they're opposing the people. Nehemiah, over and over again, will not let that opposition stop him. He says, remember God. Remember what he can do. Remember the mission. Remember all of it. And you have to have that grittiness and that courage to make sure you stand up against opposition. And we always want to be doing that. If we do this right, and we do it for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, guys, you can't imagine what it's going to be like when you get to heaven. Like We're, we're talking about sacrifices, and we're going to do these on earth. And we're going to do that for a limited time here. And we're doing these sacrifices so that, like Paul said, not seeking our own advantage, but that of the many so that other people get saved. That's why we're doing these things. And when we stand in heaven one day in glory, enjoying the chorus of people worshiping God, that's going to be incredible. If you don't have that as your ultimate aim, like, oh, I'm doing this because I know in heaven I'm going to rejoice over these things, I don't know that you're going to be motivated to do it. I was thinking about that with this picture. Remember my dad, we we lived in Maine for a while, and uh, during the winter months, I think it was at the YMCA uh, we were part of, uh, my dad would would join these uh, competitions. One of them, maybe you've seen some of these before, it was like, you know, climb to Everest on the Stairmaster. They, they do these competitions before. Like, you get on a Stairmaster, and, like, Everest is, like, 29,000 feet or something like that. So they map out what that is, and, like, you have to take the amount of steps that it would take, and then you've climbed Everest in that sense, and you win a shirt to do that. And so I always thought, wow, Dad, that's so cool. Like, you climbed Everest in that sense. But that's what you'd think when you're a little kid, and you see your dad wear a shirt that says, I climbed Everest. When you get, and you find out what a Stairmaster is, and you find out that you were just in a room, stepping and doing nothing, like, where was the majesty and the glory of Everest? It it wasn't there. It was just really going through the motions of doing that with no real majesty behind it. But think of the person who really climbs Everest, who really puts every step of the arduous journey and then stands at the top and views the majesty. That's why it's worth it. If you are here and you are saved by the grace of God, you are guaranteed to get to that top. It will be a difficult journey, but you can't imagine what it's going to be like until you get up there. I understand right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you trying to do this would be you getting on a Stairmaster and it wouldn't get you anywhere. You wouldn't see any sort of glory. So what we're saying is, those who are saved by the grace of God, use that grace now to serve him wholeheartedly and watch God do some incredible things here. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for this opportunity to take a look at your word, great examples of people who have sacrificed for your namesake. God, may we be those type of men who are willing to make those sacrifices, those type of men who are willing to depend upon you, those type of men who are willing to encourage and challenge and develop one another, those type of men who care, who are never tempted to either escape or to build our own empire, but want to do something great for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. May we remember what Jesus says. We need to serve because even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. God, you have ransomed us from our sins. You've saved us. We are not under its power. We don't have to serve its penalty. It was paid for on the cross. And now we get to serve you, God, and to see great things happen if we're just willing to abandon our own promotion and live for you. So help us to have that hunger and desire. God, we pray in your son's wonderful name. Amen.